how did you learn to conduct ceremony out of interest? Um, <clears throat> I think it really came from growing up with parents that were pastors and growing up, um, yeah, with, with parents who minister and in a tradition and community of people who congregated folks to, yeah, be in prayer and mm. to be in praise and worship. So I think coming from that lineage and then wanting to, yeah, wanting to ground or widen the sphere of who we know to be creator. Um, yeah, that, that draw um, towards spirit still felt really strong for me. So I think it, I'm very influenced by, yeah, growing up with them and just, yeah, guided by people who, who pray and have a spirit, spiritual way. And then I think in more recent years, um, I've really um, been impacted by Joanna Macy's work um, and the work that Reconnects practice, moving to this spot in Oakland called Kensico Farm that was embodying um, Joanna's practice as like the fulcrum of um, the way of being there. So being introduced to the work that reconnects also really, um, yeah, I think brought me deeper into a form to hold prayer and to hold ceremony. Yeah. I'm working for Joanna. So Harry was telling me a bit about your work. Obviously I've come into contact with it relatively recently. Listen to your stuff on For the Wild and it's, it's really stunning. Um, mm. And yeah, Harry was telling me that your kind of main interest, is this correct, is in um, transformative justice mm -hmm. and how that, how that can be done in community. Mm -hmm. um, so can you yeah. tell me a bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I think that, well, thank you for giving me more context for, yeah, yeah no this worries. prayer and vision. Um, and I think, yeah, I feel like uh, black and brown folks in the U.S. and whiter than the U.S. have been impacted by the U.S. prison and military industrial complex. And it's really, it's really determined our way of life and a cosmology of punishment and a way of being that's uh, facilitated by um, shame and that capitalism is also generated and facilitated and upheld through shame, which also is about um, a, from a carceral and punitive culture to me. So I think that moving towards um, or locating like what the medicine of healing or repairing that cosmology would, would require relationship and it requires knowing one another and it requires, um, yeah, our stories to be held by uh, a wider public and to be deprivatized and to not be people who could be dehumanized because you didn't, you didn't have a relationship. Our inquiry with Led to Life and my own just practice in life is really meditating on how can we make that work public? How can we grieve in public? How can we account in public? How could we be willing to surrender and ask for forgiveness publicly together in ceremony and community? And how do we create or restore those traditions that are available to us that are, that are ancient traditions to come forward and to be willing to account and to know that you're still going to belong and that your belonging will be facilitated through your, through truth and through justice. And I think right now the idea of being honest or um, asking for forgiveness for the histories of white supremacy and 
the carceral system, all of these things, I think people would imagine that they're not going, they're not going to have a site of belonging available to them. Um, and that's because the cosmology is about punishment. So mm. I just, I'm curious what would happen if, if people would surrender, if they knew they would, there was redemption um, available at the end. And if they knew that there were people to hold them in that vulnerability mm -hmm. and to accept them and love them anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, as you're mm. talking about the mechanisms of capitalism um, being founded on um, punitive, this idea of uh, that people deserve punishment if they're not good enough, if they're not right. Um, it also brings to mind how the capitalist system is also driven. It's very much fueled. The consumerism is fueled by the feeling I'm not good enough. I'm unlovable. Like right mm. deep down, I'm unlovable. And I will only be lovable if I acquire, if I achieve, if I, um, if I have power. And mm. um, the effects on, of that go of course go both internally and can be reflected externally and they can turn mm. into violence against others violence against oneself um, mm. super tragic oh <laughs> yeah it's so it's so deep i've been thinking a lot about um recently uh my body rebelling against um, being useful to my work and uh, my body just being tired and just like I'm asking why can't it why can't it kind of move like a machine especially in the midst of COVID where we've a lot of my work has moved online and so I feel mm -hmm. like I'm expected to produce um, or sustain an eight-hour work day on the computer and I bought all of these appendages to help me turn into a robot. And I just felt this um, upsetness of the idea that I would try and help my body feel better doing this when before it was telling me, this is not, this is not the shape. This is not, I don't want to be useful in this way. Yeah. Um, yeah, and what are the ways to be of use that are that are generative to our communities and to our to ourselves and to our health? Mm. Really, with that. Um, from our perspective at Local Futures, we see um, we see COVID as and and the crisis that we're undergoing globally right now as having two possible. You know, if you want to simplify it to two possible outcomes there's the we could be pushed down the path of more tech of more reliance on technological systems for our work for our money for our our community for our education and yet all around the world we're seeing how people are waking up to the fulfillment that comes from more genuine connection and from slowing down mm. um, and from being able to take that rest and, and how regenerative the, you know, what comes out of that can be um, mm. for both the human being and for the planet. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's another reason why we're, um, you know, one of the main reasons we're conducting World Localization Day at this time, because we really want there, we really want to bring the message that there is an economic path forward. There is a, you know, a way to change this techno-economic system that we're living in. We can resubmit it to democracy and we can start mm. to dismantle, decentralize and um, diversify what that means um, mm. rebuild strong local economies that are much more face-to-face -face and also mm. minimize the crises um, in a, every way, you know, political mm. pandemic, you know, all these crises we can move away from if we come together to focus on uh, shifting the ship away from bigger and more global and higher tech and more 
control in the hands of big money towards um, genuine democracy again and as decentralized as that can possibly be you know helping mm. to rebuild the food systems on which we require I know you um, I know you do work with the land and that you're you, you find a lot of you find a lot of healing and um, and passion by drawing on the resources of land in the natural world mm. um, so can you tell me a bit about that and how you how that healing comes about for you and the people you work with? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I love what you're sharing about um, decentralization. And I feel like there's something about decentralized efforts that really will help us um, build intimacy which is what my work with the land is about and is about um, relationship. And um, one group that I worked for, Weaving Earth, they're a nature connection school. And I need to start saying we. I keep, I keep saying they because <laughs> I, was, I was a they and now I, I work for them. You so work for them, yeah. Even when I didn't work for them, it could have still been a we. Um, and that's their <laughs> acronym. But yeah, Weaving Earth is a nature connection and ancestral arts skills school that is centered around relational education, um, both reconnecting us to the land, repairing our ability to like really engage in intimacy with, with the birds through bird language and through um, how does being able to really listen to bird language and be in communion with the birds lead us towards a different way that we uh, ground our how we practice permaculture how does that inform um, the ecology how does it inform how does the ecology inform how we care for how we grow food for ourselves but perhaps also for other for other beings reframing survival skills as earth intimacy so we've been doing a lot of work around, um, not right now because we're not gathering together, but um, the school focuses on things that people would maybe see as survival skills, fire by friction and um, learning how to build a debris hut and learning how to grow your food and make medicine and, you know, basic wilderness aid, first aid training and yeah, I love that this reframe of survival skills towards earth intimacy um, teaches that ch shifts the, I, the culture of scarcity of survival um, mm. toward the trust that the earth will provide for you when there is relationship and connection. Um, so I'm really grateful for that wisdom because I feel like I can rest into the trust that I will be provided for. And I don't know like how to forage a bunch of wild foods for myself yet, or it's not like I know. Um, yeah. It's not like I know every bird or like, I feel like I'm growing a bunch of, like I could grow a bunch of food for my community. I feel like if I wanted to do any of those things, I might be able to, but it feels more about, I'm building connection enough to know that if something went down, like now, I know that I have skills and practices that help um, resource me mm -hmm. and that I can rely upon and that there's relationships I can rely upon. Cause right now there's been, it's been, there's my attention has been taken in so many directions um, during COVID and yeah, I'm thinking a lot about how the birds have helped me reorient my attention right now and ground and just uh give over to their to their miracle and to to listening and noticing them and their constant invitation to pause i fell in love with with watching birds when i was five years old mm. and for me that was the start of my whole journey with into the work that i'm doing now because mm. i I, I think I realized retrospectively a few years ago that 
that my love for birds was an expression of my love with the diversity of the natural world, my love mm. for diversity. Mm. And, and then realizing, you know, being growing up in this world where we have an economic system that is structurally geared to eliminate diversity in mm. whatever ways it can, because it needs, it needs a homogenous market to sell to. It needs homogenized mm. production so that it can centralize the production. So it needs mm. to homogenize, uh, it, it grows in monocultures. It mm. um, brings people into a consumer culture under the guise of a kind of a facade of diversity. But really it's saying you, no matter who you are, as long as you subscribe to this worldview, as long as you participate in the consumer culture, you can be someone, you can be famous. You can, and, it, and it's so deeply <sighs> homogenizing. And so I feel mm. like that's why my love for birds translated into um, a, a desire to see localized economies that support cultural and biological diversity by their very nature, mm. by their structure. Mm. Um, and you were mentioning the interest in foraging wild food and, and relearning those earth intimacy skills. Mm. Um, and I think that's something we're starting to see an upwelling of in mm. people of our generation. Uh, I wonder if you see the same. Yeah, I think we're realizing um, the, what you're talking about with the facade of what we've been sold and what we've been socialized into and how um, exhausting it is and how it doesn't, um, it doesn't, it's not life affirming. So I think that I'm so glad that it's, yeah, that we're garnering attention where I don't think we, yeah, just caring for the environment and being closer to the places that we're around is, is garnering um, more attention and becoming something like more like a, a more righteous life to live, to, to care for place and to mm -hmm. care for um, the health of the communities around you. I love that that is becoming popularized and it could go even further. I think we haven't, I think we're just skimming the surface for sure totally. in that, yeah. in that attention and it's it's quite a delayed um vision and i would say it's a lot you know in the western world we are coming to something that's just been so old and is happening in other places um where people have been doing these this kind of work that we're drawn to and mm. um yeah, I think about that a lot where what is what is high and what's new is being done and is not being recognized in the global south or um, in like indigenous worldviews and ways. Yeah, I'm just curious about who who becomes popular and who receives recognition, especially when we're not citing who is doing this, who teaches us about this, whose worldviews do we um, trump over, who ends up making more money off of these kinds of ways of uh, wisdom. Um, yeah, I think it's something to hold, to keep the work in integrity and mm. to think about redistribution of, of wealth as these ideas start to gain more attention because I've, I've never felt more like the work that I'm doing is more relevant or called upon. And yeah, it makes me ask like, who's been doing this? Who's really been doing this stuff and how do we enlist them um, to bring their voices forward and to not, so folks don't think this is something just, this is something new. Like you say, there's this upwelling of something very old and very ancient that is, you know, from a shorter time span can be can seem to be new whereas actually it's an upwelling of something incredibly old and timeless and um you know as as humans we evolved in relationship in deep relationship with each other and with the more than human others around us and the ecosystems around us um and so then by definition 
that is what it is to be human. You know, almost mm. you can say that we've been removed from our humanity and we're now coming back to reconstitute it mm. by filling mm. up, filling ourselves up with these relationships that are so much more fulfilling mm. Mm. than, um, than this facade consumer culture that we've been, that we've been given. And the tragedy in so many ways is that the people who have, who are maintaining those skills and those, the relationships that have been present for, for them for many generations, they have, you know, those intact, more land-based cultures. And those are the people who are being told that and who have been told for the past decades, you know, since colonialism, but especially in the past 30 decades that you need to look a certain way. You need to look white. You need to look, you need to have blue eyes, fair hair, like, and that to live on the land is something dirty, backwards, primitive, poor. And they're being told that in schools as well as on media in thousands of advertisements a day. And, Mm -hmm. and that's why we think it's so important to bridge and have conversation between those of us in the Western industrialized world who've grown up in this way and those who are just being told that that's what glamour is and who haven't actually seen the reality of it in many cases and are being basically with this PR machine are being made to feel insecure and that they should abandon the knowledge of their, of their ancestors. Um, <sighs> <laughs> you, you, it's you so deep deep breaths <laughs> <laughs> it's, you got to just a big sigh like mm. it's so wild that it's so backwards like and what really sucks is that you know I've been writing about this and thinking about this a lot um in a text that I've been writing called decompose I've been thinking a lot about um growing up in a black community that really was you know not necessarily my family but the community i grew up around was very affluent um black americans and um capitalism was so um entangled with uh christianity in the mega church Mm. and for-profit church that I grew up in um, among so many other blessings. But I think a lot about how um, that church and that cosmology influenced me and the ways it still has a stronghold on me. And yeah, just this way that you... um, it's kind of like I'm at a place where I, I know so much about how I should live now. And there's these edges of me that are like, I didn't get to have that piece of the American pie that I wanted that you told me I should crave and I should long mm. for. I never got to experience that life. And um, yeah, and I feel sometimes upset that I've, given it up or like that I've already said like no I know that this is not for me I know that this is not in I just noticed that like wow it's so interesting that I feel yeah I've had to go through a grieving process that I will not be a part of the project that I don't get to receive the fruits of this project and thinking what it is to ask um, dispossessed people to renounce possession i think about that a lot i think about what it what it requires to say you no, we need you not to do the thing we did for all of these years we need to tell you you don't get to you know for our like indigenous for this like indigenous fetishization and also like um this idea that like for our own sake we need you to stay intact for, for us, yeah. which is true. And it comes from um, our own loss and our own displacement and our own like lack of cultural orientation or groundedness. It feels uh, so complex. Mm. I yeah. think um, 
I've thought of a lot about this question as well because I, the organization I work for started in a place in the Tibetan plateau called Ladakh, which was mm. one of the last places on earth to be colonized. It wasn't opened up to the global economy until the 70s. It had wow. been, it was on the, um, it was in the desert, you know, high in the mountains. So no, no colonists had really been interested in going there to extract resources. It had always been a trade route along the Silk Road historically, but had never been you know, outwardly colonized um, until tourism and um, the global economy in the form of subsidized food and fossil fuel based infrastructure comes in in the 70s very abruptly. Mm. And, and so I, I worked over there three months of every year for the past five years. And mm. um, yeah, it, it used to really, it used to be a question that plagued my mind. Like, how can I be, um, how can I be saying, yeah, but I, I, it's almost hard for me to phrase this question now because I feel like I've, I feel like I've seen through it in a way mm -hmm. because, um, because what it is, it's about sharing information. It's about, it's about sharing the more human reality behind the mirror, the glamorized mm. image of mm. which they are getting, you know? So it was always something that we were sometimes critiqued on, like, um, oh, you're here saying that people should be living in a certain way. But then it's like, well, we're not saying that. We're coming here bringing information because wow. corporations have come here and they're coming here every day, every minute of every day with advertisements that say you mm -hmm. should be living in a certain way. And we're actually trying to counteract that with the more human mm. reality and more of a, a mm. 3d picture, not just this flat image. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so in your own case, I wonder if, um, I, I think we, we are similar in this way that like I could have decided to, follow a path in which I would earn a lot more money and have a lot more comforts and luxuries. Um, but then <laughs> <laughs> at the same time, it's like, I would have just, I would have lost out on, on the relationships that are what it is to be human, you know, building mm -hmm. and, and opening up the vulnerability that is required to step out of this um, consumer rat race and say, actually, mm -hmm. I'm not that. Um, and, and, you know, a, a more, a deeper soul searching of who am I then? And, mm. and, you know, creating of that person and realizing also having work that is meaningful and being able to go out into the natural world and feel like I can have, feel like I can be present with her because, mm. um, because I'm not, you know, having to compartmentalize the work that I do as something that I know is destructive, but you know, it's like, I can be more real. Mm. And mm -hmm. I, I just feel like that is, that is enriching in a way that um, we wouldn't get if we'd followed the conventional path. No, exactly. Mm. <laughs> no, we wouldn't have, we, we wouldn't have received that. Yeah, I feel, I feel grateful for the the complexity. I think it's, I think living in a like uh, post-colonial context renders things very complex and like in a globalized context we're, it's, yeah, we're deeply entangled in so many very confusing identities, narratives, longings, um, visions for the future. Uh, we're we're on so many different time scales and orientations and um yeah i'm i'm curious how we approach um repair mm. that honors that complexity and is with the humor and futility of that complexity because it is so big and it is so strange and we are so estranged from truly, yeah, I think knowing what the, I don't think, I don't think we live in a time anymore where there is a, 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 a most just or, or cleanest offering. I think a lot about the work of the Emergence Network, who I'm supporting as a, a project 
um, I'm supporting them with a project this year as a curator and I've learned a lot from their work of um, thinking about our thinking about our entanglements and thinking about um, challenging how we approach our activism and yeah, asking this question from Bioko Malafe um, around how, how we, yeah, what if how we're responding to the crisis is a part of it. I think a lot of that is because we want to give a more, yeah, a more clean or compartmentalized offering. And really it's so much, the, the problem and the, um, the trauma is so, complex and our identities and who we are in them, who we work with together as people is so complex. It feels like it would, it really requires um, humor and trickster, tricksterdom. <laughs> tricksterdom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you know Alnor Lada? I do. Um, I don't know him personally, but my boss does and she was on a call with him and he was saying he doesn't think we know yet how deep the trauma is of being yeah. in this post-colonial globalized society. Yeah. Um, but, that, but that intuitively he knows that the place that, that the healing starts is in community. Mm. And you were speaking also about, um, in, this, mm. in Sar Sarotany, um, mm -hmm. about the you know, community-based ceremony, being able to alchemize and transform anything, all the grief, mm -hmm. all, the, um, all the trauma that we, mm -hmm. that we might be experiencing is something that can be alchemized by the power of coming together in vulnerability and being vulnerable with each other mm. in community. Mm. Um, and I, I think for me, that's, that's a point that also speaks to the regenerative capacity of the earth you know mm. like we we have been told by scientists that there is little there is little hope for life on earth at this point um, <laughs> and that we you know in australia we've got to get used to these mega fires every summer and i i feel like we don't know enough to um to say that in in surety because if we remove the hand of the economic system, this kind of robotic hand that's squeezing the earth, and just for a moment, if you remove that, you see how you see the power of regeneration that comes up mm. even in COVID mm. with this, you know, comparatively tiny pause of the global economy, <laughs> the return of nature, the the cleaning of the air, and um, all all the time we're we're seeing how regenerative the natural world is mm. and and in community we see how regenerative the human being is mm. when we remove that that same hand that's telling us we're not good enough as we are and start to discover that we are good enough with other people mm. and the healing that can come from that you know the the mm. addiction the depression the hate the violence that can be healed mm. i'm sure you have experience of that mm. Yeah, I really feel the, <sighs> just the gravity of um, ceremony being able to hold, 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 yeah, mystery. I think we, what Alnor is saying that, you know, we don't know how deep this trauma goes. It's, I really don't think we do because we're not given the space um, via capitalism or capitalism, you know, uh, prevents, we, we're oriented towards a capitalist timescape and that's the rhythm that we, we move in. And because of that, we're not given uh, the depth of, rest and pause and um, Sabbath that would allow us to really feel the, to feel the edges of our trauma. I know mm. if I rest for a while, I can actually feel like even today, just pausing for a moment and asking, could I have a little more time to eat? 
um, I could feel how tired I was like from these, from this, from just this past week of police brutality from the, you know, hundreds of years, I imagine this in my body from my lineages of colonization and trauma and just people not actually getting the room to grieve in the ways that would allow our imaginations um, to birth something different. It's like, if you're, how can we imagine something different when really our minds and imaginations and hearts and bodies are occupied by the delusions of white supremacy and capitalism? We need to produce, like we, we happen to be at like, all of the most important intersections and it's rare for me to see I don't know a lot of groups like us who are doing things at the intersection of racial environmental justice ceremony art practice uh we do a lot of different work trying to weave together different movements and yeah there's this there's this urgency in the deficit of um in the deficit of spaces like that I feel like we have to come produce and our team is like, we need to produce something to repair the gravity of this trauma or to, we, we're the offering. And today I just was like, I don't want to do anything. I really don't want to do anything. I actually need to pause and I need to fast and I need to listen. And I, I'm curious actually about, um, what happens to yeah what happens through ceremony as fugitivity is a lot of what i've been thinking about what happens when ceremony allows us to steal away into another imagination into another way of being into another quality of time um into a part of ourselves that we don't get to be that we don't get to show other people um, feels really important and yeah I'm, I'm also conscious of the ways that that capitalism and hyper productivity also um, you know come into our practice and come into our our way of being but I do think that I do think that there's something um, there is there is so much that needs to be accounted for even if it wasn't in our lifetime, there's so much, there's so many inheritances that we're all um, complicit in and that we benefit from or we don't. And yeah, I think I can't imagine any other place but ceremony as the site to start to instigate um, that the emergence and acknowledgement of, Mm. of our trauma and of our grief. Um, I I feel like that can only happen at a local level. It can only happen with people with whom we have longstanding relationships with. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought about when we first started um, Led to Life. I could feel because people like memes and people um, want to catch on to something, you know, like this meme of the guns to shovel vision. They want to, that's something that you could capitalize on. I was interested in the appropriation of memes because it, um, it's appropriative of capitalism and it also, and of propaganda, but underneath we could hold a much deeper prayer and it, we've had to be really careful to not let it um, become something different because there is that longing to try and take it and make it something mm. um, different. But yeah, I've never, people have, you know, there've been invitations to do things that are big or national or my sister, she, who's in fashion, she messaged me today, fast fashion mostly, she messaged me today asking, you know, she feels really called by her work in this moment and realizing like, I, you know, I want to link you up with these big people and we could do this. And I'm like, it's not going to have the same integrity. It really I'm very interested in this thing from um, the Climate Lens Playbook and uh, Una Chaduri's work. She does work around climate change and climate justice and theater. 
they have this thing called the Climate Lens Playbook that's for ritual theater artists or for theater artists. And one of the tenets is an invitation to practice locality, to really do work at the local level and then to have um, your eyes scanning in the back of your head in the global for interrelatedness. And I love that our work, though we've been invited to different cities, it always is emerging from the truth of that place and bringing in people who are most deeply grounded in that place so that they can continue the prayer of what emerges from the small window of time that we're in ceremony, that there are people that we know can actually continue together and that we're building relationships that will be sustained. Um, and I love that about our organizing. It's really instigated very beautiful connections between people who weren't working together that are now working together and they didn't know each other and they were in the same town, <laughs> but they got to be in the, they got to be in the power of, of ceremony and of prayer and that, that changed all of us to, you know, to witness, to witness alchemy together and to be a part of it really like you were at that and I was at that and that <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> I've heard someone say that, you know, the first time you meet someone is a fractal of the rest of your relationship. So it's like, if, if the start of our relationship is alchemy, you know, what is the, how does that relationship um, begin to fractal out in our communities and in our organizing? And yeah, I love that it's, I love that it's place based in that way. Mm, and so exciting. I'd love to ask you about, if you can at this time, um, share a bit of your vision for what just you know, truly just communities look like in the future? What, what, is that, what does that future look like to you? Yeah. Um, yeah, a friend asked me the other day who has been gathering um, a practice called Nuns and Nuns. They've been gathering nuns and young, like millennials who aren't uh, religiously affiliated perhaps, but like on a census, for example, would write none on their religious affiliation, N-O-N-E. Um, <laughs> but they've been gathering nuns and these nuns who in their work, actually, they are spiritually oriented into what monastic um, organizing and spiritual devotion looks like and to weave people intergenerationally and to mobilize sisters into action at this moment. And to reimagine the future of convent spaces across the U.S., which I learned that the Catholic Church is the largest landowner in the world. So I have to uh, fact check about that. But I guess through all of their land, mm. through all of their churches, they own the most land. The first thing I said to my friend who's from Nuns and Nuns who asked me about my vision uh, for my people the other day, similarly, I just said I would love for us to start where we practice. Um, I want us to really practice Sabbath together as a beginning. And to me, Sabbath in the Jewish lineage is just of really taking a time outside of time where you really rest and you really feel like your work is complete. And I was sharing with her that what happens when we start to practice this ritual and tradition of stealing away of not using um, current, of not using financial currency, of just like really pausing to be intimate with time in another way and just presence. And what happened if that, you know, that Shabbatic time started to, yesterday my partner said he had a Shabbat hangover from the weekend. <laughs> Um, Cause we did, we went into the 24 hours of Sabbath and then Sunday we were like, oh, I can't really get anything done today. And I kind of want that, that Sabbath hangover to just take us over where we just, we refuse, we refuse capitalism and um, yeah, we just, we focus on, on intimacy. My dream is that we could really be willing to be accountable to our bioregions and that that would be the most meaningful thing we could do is to just care for the beings that are near us. Um, I've been listening so much to this uh, Louis Armstrong and 
I forget who's singing it with him. I feel bad, but um, mm. it's the song is called "The Nearness of You." It's really beautiful, and there's something about just like, um, yeah, just really being being intimate with with a place that feels so deep to me. It's why I, I told my partner that I really love him recently because he is a he's one of the first people I've met that knows just this bioregion so well and is so intimate with this place and I I would long for a world where that's really attractive <laughs> to just to care for where you are and to care for that um for that intimately and uh, yeah I think a a c communities where we marked time through rites of passage where we marked thresholds where we knew to come together at different moments to say something is happening to each of us and we're gonna we're gonna gather at the realm of the spiritual to account for what's moving i really wish for that like in this moment where i know that we're we've been in a rite of passage and we don't have the traditions or practices to help hold us um, right now. But I, I long for that, for us to be equipped with that, um, for us to know, to, for us to know the, the trace of supply chains and feel the connection of things that we receive to feel their intimacy, to feel their matter, um, to know where they've come from. Like there's, I think our separation from source is our biggest trauma. Um, so something about being able to just really feel origin mm. and bring us back to the tradition of culture. Um, yeah, feels like mm. it would just really be, <laughs> oh my God, we'd be so well. <laughs> so, yeah. We would be such well people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I totally agree. Thank you so much for that. That was like, yeah super um that's going to be perfect for yeah. for our purpose because um well what we mean by localization is by is exactly that rebuilding of interdependence with the beings around you through mm -hmm. the shortening of economic distances wherever mm -hmm. possible particularly mm -hmm. with our basic needs with food with clothing with shelter by coming back into contact with the people who we rely on to provide those things and the nature who we rely on to provide those things. Um, that, yeah, for us, that is the, that is the structural economic basis that on which culture, on which intergenerational knowing and in which deep mm. knowing of place of indigenous mm. science, all of that mm. starts to be, and we've lost so much of that. But mm. we, we, we think, we know through localization that through that kind of economic shift in direction, we can start to rebuild that, um, you know, help those who are still custodians of that knowledge mm. at a structural level to, mm. to, to become, for that to become the source of flourishing and of, and of nourishment for those people again. And mm. for all of us to learn from that and to move into that space with our own bioregions by reconnecting locally. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Yes. That, yeah. Yes, vision. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm inspired. Yeah. I'm like, I know I have to take my rest, but now I'm like, I've been thinking a lot about, I've been thinking a lot about the intersections of theology and urban planning. And I don't want to get a PhD because that seems silly now, but. <laughs> um, the world's burning um yeah. but i have i have thought about like what would it be to be who in my community could help me could help anchor me in the, in that intimacy of being in in an inquiry like that for mm. a set of time for a deep set of time and to say i'm in this study which i already feel like i am but i want to go further and i've been thinking about yeah how do you host god and really creator and like um, just creation care at the, at the heart of how we think about cities because I'm from a city, but now I've moved more into like wanting to live in rural spaces. And I just feel like there's a lot of medicine that could be brought to cities, especially because I'm like, well, I don't want to work in the rural. That's, there's no black people out here. 
how do I bring these kinds of teachings into um, cities? And it just, what you just shared about the visions for localization, just, yeah, I think about people like my sister who has amazing influences and is in fast fashion, or I have this, everyone I grew up with is like rappers now, they're in movies. It's just, everyone is, has these huge platforms and I'm so proud of them to be black and successful. I'm also like, man, how do we shift what we're doing and allow those folks to to come into these teachings and feel like, um, yeah, the merit and our orientation is different and what inspires us about how we could live is so different. So I just love hearing about that vision and yeah, it caused me into my own reckoning around ways I've, um, I've, I've, um, yeah, I haven't been close to what used to call my heart like this. So mm. I'm grateful for this, for that reawakening in me mm. around what, what that intimacy provokes. Yeah. And what that way of life, what that way of life could offer. It's really beautiful. Mm. Thank you, Bronte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thanks for spending this time and for coming to do this, even when you feel the call to rest so strongly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'm so grateful. Um, the last thing is if there's, if there's any spoken word or any art that you'd like to share with us, we would be also so, so grateful and we'd really appreciate that um yeah i don't know i don't know if you have any if you have any ideas that come to mind or if if that would be possible or, or perhaps that would be too much right now as well well it depends i could either send something or um i just wrote this a mantra um to welcome birds and what they bring to me so that oh would God. be I think it's relevant to our conversation. We're doing this bird language webinar and uh, we wanted to welcome the birds at the beginning. So this came the other day um, to me. <sighs> Wild winged ones, we welcome you. We extend our gratitude to the way you offer us the poetics of release, the ensembled sigh at dawn, the way you smudge the wind with your song till the medicine of your levity rewilds my attention till I spill into laughter or quiet or awe, how you weave my heart towards humble that I might learn to dance in chorus as one little body among so many others murmuration as a prayer to ecologize our efforts toward justice. My listening widens to host your hymn with radical hospitality so I can receive the gift of refusal, refusing the story of isolation, refusing the story that humans are the center, refusing the story of capitalism. Instead, inviting the daily Sabbath of your company folding into your tenderness <sighs> till I become rest, till I notice you are everywhere, till I notice you are the bridge that helps connect me to the world, till I orient towards your rhythm as my practice in resistance, till I'm called to protect and orient toward you. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much. That, yeah, that was, that was so really, relevant. It was so relevant. It's like <laughs> <laughs> one of those meant to be moments. Yeah, that felt, I was like, oh my God, this is totally like our conversation. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I mm -hmm. love, I love when those, it's like when the fractals of the universe reveal themselves and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, we're on the right path here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's my favorite moment. Thank you so much for this conversation. It was very nourishing. Oh, uh, thanks, Roger. I'm glad you found it that way and not draining. Yeah, it yeah, was. Me too, it, I found it.
I'm glad I came sleepy. It helped me be just, I feel like I was just honest. I feel like when I have a lot more excitement, I start to lie, like, or just say things that are not lie, but just say things from a place of like really resource energy, yeah. um, <laughs> which is a lot more generous. And so today I was, if I feel like I spoke from a really honest place, so I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm very so grateful. Thank you so much.